And he said, I'm, I'm barely home. I'm barely with my, I, I, I'm, I'm getting off of my regular job and going to work from 5 to midnight. He said, I'm tired. I've got no energy. And I said, well, why do you work? He said, to pay my debts. I said, if you get up every day to pay a debt, hell's going to keep debt in your life. God is not the God of debt. Tell two or three people he's the God of increase. Tell somebody besides say he's the God of increase. He's the Lord of the harvest. Hallelujah. He's Lord of the harvest. That means I'm Lord of the seed. Somebody's got to sow the seed to activate the harvest. God said, if you do what you do, I'll do what I love to do. I'll bring the increase to your seed. Woo, I feel like just shouting hallelujah. You don't realize that you're a walking warehouse of seed. You're a walking warehouse of seed. Everything We just sowed a seed of praise and worship to God. I just gave him some time. I'm a seed of praise and worship. You're, everything you do is a seed for a heart. I, if I smile, you smile back. Every, so you look at somebody and say, you're a walking warehouse of seed. Now, I say that because if you don't like your harvest, stop complaining about it. Just change your, change your seed. If you don't like what you're eating, buy something else. If you don't like apples, buy oranges. Don't sit there and eat an apple and complain about it. Make a different decision. So it's good, so good to have you. This is, I believe this is Palm Sunday. Isn't this Palm Sunday? It's so good to have you in the house. If, you're, if you are new to the Faber Nation, we are a crazy church full of misfits that love the benefits of the kingdom of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're a misfit, Ron. Did you know that? You're a misfit. That's why we're good best friends. Two misfits bring benefits. Hallelujah. Listen, I want you to write down September 21st through the 23rd if you're a man or you're a woman that wants your, your husband or your, your baby daddy to know God. But you know, the, the millennials got baby daddies. So I want to get them saved too. For them children's sake. Right down September 21st through the 23rd is our men's conference that's going to be here. It's in Myrtle Beach. Uh, if you'll go to the bank at the end of service, you'll see Ron Giordano back there. Stand up, Ron. Everybody see what you look like. He's that skinny guy right there in the room, right your left. He is the men's leader. I've known Ron 25 years. It's been the most joyous 25 years. I'm, I'm not lying. Why are you laughing? Oh, okay. It wasn't a joke. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. That's our text today. We're talking about the seven last statements of a dying man that changed the world. The seven last statements of a dying man. I want to tell you, I went to a play last night, Redeemed by the Blood of a Lamb. What an awesome play. Is pineapple in the house anywhere? Pineapple, stand up right real quick. I want to tell you, I was impressed. You were, it was an anointed play, and I could tell as you wrote that play, the Holy Ghost was inspiring you like he did the apostles because I always be honest with you I cried like a girl and I tried not to cry one time and you ever get that time where you know the Lord's moving and you try not to cry and you just everybody catch it then because then you get that <laughs> trying not to cry that's what I did right there I know everybody turned and looked at me my sister put her arm around me and said I pray for you <laughs> it was powerful thank you for writing it thank you Thank you. People were touched last night. People were touched last night. Uh, it, it made me think of a book I'm going to write. From parent to grandparent to parent. That the millennials that were parents who became grandparents ended up becoming the parent to raise the mistakes of the desire of the millennials. What do you think about that? It'd be a good book, wouldn't it? I'm going to write it. Hurry up, copyright that before somebody steals it. Luke chapter 23. Did I tell you there? Did I tell you to go? Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you don't go to the Bible much, go to Mark, turn right. 
get your pens out, your notebooks out. We want to talk today. Seven last statements of a dying man. Jesus is on the cross. He has endured being spat on, being ridiculed, being mocked. He's endured the cat of nine tails and a scourging that most wouldn't have survived by Roman soldiers where the back of his body and his skin was ripped to hamburger-like material. He was beaten so bad, according to Isaiah, he would be unrecognizable. Even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. His bones were aching. His body was dehydrated. They were laughing at him, scorning him, and now he's dying. It's not a God on the cross, it's a man. Say this, man's on the cross, not God. It's a man on the cross. He asked God if he could skip the cross. He said, is there any other way? And I've learned this about Jesus as I'm studying this, and I want you to hear this. I've learned it. I'm learning it that if you follow the example of Jesus, you're going to find out that you have to give up your wants for his will. You should write that down somewhere because that's a key to your success. As long as you think you have the right to do what you want opposite of what he asked you to do. And what he asked you to do comes through the word of God, not through your own. Most people think, well, he talks to me. He'll talk to you through mentors. He'll talk to you through his word. But it, it's just amusing to me how many people who, who read the Bible, know the Bible, still try to control God in their wants. And Jesus is on the cross, and he has an assignment. His assignment is to be a mediator, an intercessor. His assignment as, a, as God-man is to stand between you and God so you can find grace. This is his assignment. He has no other assignment. He's not an entrepreneur. He is assigned to pay a debt you owed. And he's going to pay it with his life. And he's going to pay for your sin. So he's not doing what he wants. He's doing what God wills. So he's on the cross. He's hanging on nails. He's pushing on nails. He's He's, he's hoping to hurry up and get where he's got to go. And he's in Luke 23, verse, I believe it's verse, let me see what verse, 34. So he's laying there. And, and when he had come to the place called Calvary, there were, they crucified him and the criminals on one side and the others on the other side, verse 34. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And while he is praying or talking to the Father, he's asking the Father to forgive them. They're gambling at his feet over his garments. They're trying to divide his garments and cast lots. And the, spe and the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, He healed others, He delivered others. Let Him save Himself if He is the Christ, the chosen of God. And He says, God, forgive them. They know not what they do. So last week we talked about abandonment. We talked about that Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? And the word forsaken there was, why, has, why did you abandon me here? That wasn't the deal. I didn't know I was going to die with rejection on this. I can be rejected by them, but I didn't know you were going to reject me at the last moment. And abandonment has, has been the, the, the way of people and the way of, of hurting people. And the whole play uh, yesterday that I watched, uh, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb, it was a woman who is taking on the mistakes of people and taking their children in, and she's mothering them, but she wasn't, she wasn't, though, she didn't birth them, but she's raising them. And 
the one girl is rebellious and hurt, and, and she's being rebellious, and she's, and she's being uh, obstinate, but it's not really what she wants to be. She's responding to abandonment. And abandonment has caused a lot of problems because it's what we all go through in certain areas, and it can be as, 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 as harsh as a husband feeling abandoned by a wife or a wife feeling abandoned by a husband or, or by a parent. or by, And so he's dealing with abandonment. Now we are talking about forgiveness because what really is the focal point here is that Jesus is telling you that even when you have the right for vengeance, it is the will of God to forgive. I want you to write somewhere in your notes, I must forgive everybody. So I'm going to talk to you here for a few minutes because we need to learn how to forgive. And we think we forgive people, but we don't. And it's interesting to me that the assignment of Jesus, according to First or 2 Timothy 2.5, there says there's one God. It might be 1 Timothy 2, 5. It says there's only one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. So we know according to Hebrews 9 and, and Timothy 2 and Hebrews, we know according to the book of Galatians, the book of Hebrew, we know that Jesus' assignment is to stand between you and sin or between you and your debt, okay? And his job is to mediate for you and to intercede for you. And when I read this, God said to me, he said, he has to maintain his assignment even on the cross. He fulfills his calling by saying, even on the cross, them that are spitting on him and ridiculing him and even sneering him, he still mediates between them and God and says, forgive them. Let them off the hook. And, and, and it dawned on me the reason that Jesus is talking to the Father because Jesus lived 33 years as a man. And he's trying to tell God, I know what they're doing, but I also know why. You don't know their why, you only know their what. And, and you got to learn that before you judge another person's what, you ought to stop and start asking their why. Because some people might be reacting in their what because they're really hurting over the why. Why am I rejected? Why have I been overlooked? Why have I been ignored? And he says, I know that they really don't know. And now he's not just speaking of what he's doing on the cross because the Herod hated him and the religious mocked him. He knew that spiritually there was a warfare taking place uh, that none of those people could see, but that the demonic and the angelic were waiting to see uh, what's going to happen with a weapon called Jesus. Is the man going to die and stay dead? Or is God going to intervene in the man? And three days later, we know the outcome, hallelujah, that God stepped up out of death, hallelujah. But when he stepped out out of death, he redeemed man from death. I've been reversed from the curse. Tell four or five people, say, there is no more curse on you. There is no more curse on you. There is no more curse on you. I don't care what hell has put on you. They did this thing all day yesterday, and I, I, got, I went to bed and couldn't stop saying it. But they went on, they opened up this play with, if it put a praise on it. Look at somebody say, put a praise on it. I went to bed thinking, when cancer comes, put a praise on it. When poverty's knocking on the door, throw a praise up on it. When racism tries to knock, put a praise on it. You can't praise if you can't forgive. Uh, when I started praising him, I started forgiving things. Uh, somebody said, I'm going to forgive so I can put a praise on it. Matter of fact, let me just take a little praise pause. Uh, why don't you just put a praise on it right now? From the back to the front, why don't somebody just say, yeah, I put a praise on it. Now, if you're, if you're raised like I was in church, if, if you just want to be a real white, kind of a white praiser, just kind of wave at me like this a little bit. That's how white folk do it. That's how white folk do it. We're just going to put pra Come on, white folk, help me out. Come on, John, help me out back there. Put a praise on it. So you feel like you're doing something. 
I mean, if you were real, real religious, you just kind of give me a finger. <laughs> but do something. Do it out there. Just give me a finger. You know, hallelujah. Not this one. That means you're leaving. This one. Only black folk do the finger when they're leaving. I was preaching at a church, and people kept doing this, and I kept looking up, preaching. I thought something was falling out of the ceiling. <laughs> Y'all seeing something? Then the bishop come over and whisper, he said, no, they just, they leaving. That's, they, that's telling you they leaving. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. It's what it is. You don't never know what I'm going to say. You just got to un unbuckle the seatbelt and hang on. I get 30 minutes of embarrassment, I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. If my wife don't do her head like this twice, I ain't said nothing. If y'all watch pastor, if she don't roll her eyeballs, I ain't said nothing yet. What is forgiveness? What is it? What is it? What is forgiveness? What is it? You know, how do you forgive? What is forgiveness? Why is God so concerned about it? Why do I have to do it? That's just some people I like to hate. Oh, did I say that out loud? I was thinking that. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Let me show you the list of those people. Real, come up here. I'll show you a list of these people. I used to have a prayer. See, I was young in the Lord. I was, I was all Italian in my prayer life, and I had a praise list and a hit list. And I'd say, God, these people are no good. You can get rid of them if you want to. People hurt you. I grew up dyslexic, struggled in high school, went through a terrible act as a child uh, as a uh, was wasn't my mom and daddy's fault it, there were good parents in there but you know the enemy has a way of deceiving and slipping in and hurting people and uh, so I had a lot of attack as a young child in my mind over over a sexuality of being molested and uh, not sexuality and that I, I didn't like girls and all but just you know whatever forget it so uh, <laughs> just just want to clarify that so be no Facebook and okay because you, you, you people be Facebooking anything. <laughs> Spell that right. I remember praying to God one time and saying, Lord, I just don't understand why I have all these hurdles in my life. Why there's all these struggles in my life? And then the Lord began to speak to me. And he said, when hell sees how great your future is, he will enter you in your infant stage to keep you there. He wants to wound you at an age to keep you bound to that mindset. He said, and every time a deliverer was born, look at the earth. It, ro it rose up violence and murder. He said, when Moses was born, they start killing all the children. And when Jesus was born, Herod goes out. He said, when there's a great destiny on your life, there's great warfare as a child. Oh, hallelujah. He said, but if you survived your, the warfare, get ready. Get ready. If, you've over, if you are still alive and overcome your mess, get ready. There's a blessing on the way. You're about to discover who you really are. Because if hell didn't kill you in the worst of your past, there ain't much left in the weapon tree for your future. Matter of fact, I say one more thing here before I get in forgiveness. If hell has entered your now and is causing incredible agitation, aggravation, and frustration, it is a clue that God has already secured your future. Your future has already been set in stone and hell has left your future and has entered your present and trying to kill you from getting there. But I dare somebody say, just put a praise on it. Just put a praise on it. You're going to get to your future. What is forgiveness? What is it? Is it a feeling? No, it's not a feeling. What is forgiveness? It is a decision. It is a decision to let go of the desire of revenge. Write it down. It is to let it go. It ain't to pray about it. Look up here. I didn't say pray about it. That's what religious folk do. When you don't want to do something, you pray about it. I've been around church long enough to know that that's just an excuse that you don't want to do it. Hey, we need you to come cut the church grass. Let me pray about it. You ain't got to pray about it. Go get the lawnmower. 
Pray about it while you cut the grass. Y'all, can you go over and see Bob? He's in the hospital. Well, let me pray about it. Well, go see Bob and pray about it while you're there. Forgiveness is a decision. It's an obedient act. It is a command of God. And if you do not forgive, it is a sin. I believe a lot of people who go to church are going to get to heaven and be shocked at how much in trouble they are. Because they thought the ungodly was going to be more judged. No, you're going to be judged more by knowing truth and ignoring it than you are of those that are ignorant of it. It is a decision to let go of a desire for revenge and ill will toward any person. It's a decision to let it go that has wronged you. Now look up here because this is sensitive. That's the same, it, it goes as far as if some white guy says something bad to black people, you got to forgive them. You got to let racism go. You, you don't have a right to hold racism if you have Christ in your heart. Well, I just don't like that. Well, I'm so sorry. What is forgiveness? It is a decision. It is a decision. What does the Bible say about it? Matthew 6, 14 and 15. What does the Bible say about forgiveness? Matthew 6. Uh, wives got to forgive their husbands. Well, he, he hurt me. He, he still got to be forgiven. Matthew, what it says? Matthew 6, 14, 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, neither will God forgive you. Why do you forgive? Because you want to be forgiven. Forgiven, because I, I know you don't want to hear this, but everything's about seed and, and sowing and reaping, according to Galatians 6. Whatever man sow, that shall he reap. Everything that comes to you, you probably sowed for. And here's what God said. You want the harvest of forgiveness? Then you sow the seed of forgiveness. But I don't like what they did. Forgiving someone is not telling them you like what they did to you. When I forgive you, it's not saying I'm agreeing with how you treated me. I don't like people molesting kids. I don't like to see battered people. I don't like to see bullies picking on somebody. And forgiving people is not, Jesus is not saying, I'm okay with you crucifying me. What he's saying is, I'm okay with you in your ignorance. Forgive them, they know not what they do. He says, their ignorance has caused this. And I am forgiving them. For their ignorance. I'm not okay with it. It hurt. I cried. I wept over hurts. It, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting to me how people, I, I've read a whole magazine the other day and all about the unchurched. It's all about the unchurched right now. Everything's about the unchurched. And I understand we want to save the world and save the streets, uh, but it's all about building church for the unchurched. If I build the church for the unchurched, Where's the church? And I'm reading it and reading it, and it's talking about how the unchurched will come to church. And he says, and it says, now mind you, they probably love Jesus. They just don't love the church. That's why they're unchurched. And I said, if they don't love the church, somebody ain't taught them how to love Jesus. He is the church. But it's only in the church environment. If you go to work and people hurt you, you get up and go right back to work. If 
you go to work and somebody offends you, you go right back to work. To, if they talk about you in the break room on Monday, you still clocking in on Tuesday. Uh, they over there sneering at you in the corner, you still clocking in on Wednesday. Uh, they over there laughing at you, you clock in on Thursday. If your child comes home and says, they didn't play me and, and they, the coach put me on the bench, uh, I notice he goes back to practice again. And I know mom and daddy say, you're going to get up there. You ain't a quitter. You ain't doing it. You're going to get over there and play ball. And when they come home and say, the bully picked on me at school, I notice Junior's back on the bus. You just gave them fighting lessons that night in the bedroom. Then it comes to, but, but you come to church and somebody hurt you or talked about you and it's the same people at school that you go back to school at. It's the same people that hurt you at the job. You go back to the job. But then you come to the church and the people hurt you. You say, I'm not going to go back to that church and you blame God for the people. Now look at your neighbor and say, your ignorance is concerning us right now. Well, I ain't going back to church. Church offended me. Church didn't offend you. People did. The same people that's at school, the same people that did it at the restaurant, the same people that did it in the playground, the same people that did it. You go all back. You, you keep living your life, but you're going to blame God because you got a little wounded because somebody was ignorant in church. And so now I got to build a whole church service for the unchurched who got hurt at church. I don't change the school for them. I don't change the movie theater for them. I have somebody say, I don't go to that church. I heard a deacon cuss. Then they say, did you, did you go see that new movie? I said, man, that was more cuss worse than that movie than it was what that deacon said. Yeah, he ain't supposed to cuss in church. It's okay if we cuss in the movie. Really? That's how we are, though. We're unforgiving. What does the Bible say? If you don't forgive, God don't forgive you. Isn't that what the Bible said? How do we forgive? How do we forgive, Bishop? I'm glad you asked. Somebody asked me that question. I'm glad you asked. Number one. Number one is very deep. Move on to something else. <laughs> How do I forgive? How do I forgive mama, daddy? How do I forgive? And I'm going to tell you something. Everybody watching and sitting here Got somebody to forgive. How do I forgive? Move on to what's next. Stop living in the hurt and get on to what's next. Get beyond the hurt. You ain't going to heal till you get beyond it. Quit meditating on it. Quit dwelling on it. Quit replaying it. Stop. Why do we like to replay all the negativity when we got so much more positive in our life? When David went to face Goliath, he didn't talk about all the rejection in his life. He replayed and preplayed what was going on. And he said, well, let me tell you something. Let me, give you a, a, let me give you a replay. When a lion came up against me, I killed a lion. When a bear came up against me, I killed a bear. The anointing came on me, I killed a bear. He said, now that's a replay. Let me give you a preplay. It ain't going to be no different for this problem right here. The same God that delivered me from the crook and the serpent, the same God that took me out of hell, the same God that kept that bullet from landing in me, the same God that kept me from dying in that car wreck, the same God that kept me through molestation and kept me through, I believe we ought to put a praise on it right here. The same God that kept me alive when I was OD'd on drugs is the same God that's going to face this thing and get me to my future. The same God that kept that stroke from killing my body. You know how many people lay in a graveyard that had the same stroke, the same heartache, the same problem, but you are still alive. You know why God kept you alive? Because he's got something so big in your future. He wouldn't let the devil kill you in your now. You got to get on what's next. Somebody shout, I can't wait till what's next. 
You got to move on to what's next. If you're an entrepreneur and you knock on the door and they say no, don't cry about it because yes is in the next. Well, they didn't buy my donut. Well, the next guy's going to buy a dozen. How do you talk to your situation? You talk about it or talk to it? Number two. So step one, move to next. Your mind can't be in two places. You're not built that way. You're not God. If your mind's in one place, it can't be in another. So if you get your mind off the hurt, you'll get it on the healing. Number two, reconnect to God's spirit. Reconnect. Disconnect and reconnect. Disconnect from what hurt you and reconnect to the God who's blessing you. When everybody's kicking David to the curb, the one thing that David knew how to do was encourage himself in the presence of God. We've lost this gift in church. We got, we got to get to church before we can feel a little bit of joy. God said, you can get that joy right now by yourself. Just get up in the presence of God and, st- and don't talk about your issue. Talk about your God. Start telling your spirit, man, to remind your mind God is all-powerful. God is mighty. God is awesome. God is great. God got this thing. He got this. Somebody say, God got this. Uh, when the devil's saying, I, your child ain't going the right way, say, God's on the scene. Uh, you might not see him, but I know he's there. Why? Because I believe he's there. I trust he's there. I know he's there. That's what that psalmist said. The same God on the hill top is the same God in Shoal or hell. Hallelujah. You got to reconnect to your faith. Reconnect to God. Get in the word. Don't look for the problem in the word. Look for the solution in the king. He is bigger than cancer. He is bigger than sugar diabetes. He is bigger than divorce. He is bigger than lack and poverty and pain and racism. He is God. Number three. Step three. How do I forgive? This one ain't going to be one you like. I didn't like this one. I wanted to erase it, but God wouldn't let me. I was hoping my computer would fry and I couldn't remember it. Number three. Do not, do not, listen to me, do not fall asleep with anger in your heart. But you don't know, if you mad at your wife, you stay up. Man, if you're mad at me, Stay up. I never understood, Pastor, your first lady. I just don't understand her. She can be so mad at me and fall right to sleep. There ain't a God in her. I am laying there half the night having a conversation with myself while she's snoring over there enjoying her sleep. That's because I put a praise on it. All right, Mark, Cindy, I quit. Y'all come up here and preach for me. See, I can't sing like that. I say, put a praise on it. You better put a praise on it. So I know y'all, like, yeah, you know, now the, the, the unchurched folk right now, like, what they doing in that church? We just getting you ready for the snakes. The snakes is next. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, man. Two people just jumped up and run out of here. You just be for sure. Anybody brings a snake in this church, it's a devil, and I'm going to cast him out of here. I don't even think you love God if you got a pet snake. I mean, I'm still praying for Richie because he's got piranhas. I was like, what do you get? Do they catch a stick? Do they, can you pet them? Can you? They just look at you with their teeth. I went over to his house, and I was sitting on the edge of his couch, and I, and I turned and looked, and this fish was looking at me like this. 
I started sliding over. <laughs> Excuse me. There. He said, he looked like you food. That's a devil right there. Don't go to sleep angry. Listen, don't let the sun, God said, go down on your wrath. Let me talk some Latino women right here. Because Latino women got some wrath. I hear, I hear them at Walmart sometimes. <laughs> Poor guy. And they speak in Spanish. And Spanish sounds so good even when you're angry. For folk that don't know what you're saying, I'm thinking, oh, that's so nice. But then I looked at him and I said, oh, it must not be nice. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. When God tells you something, it's for a reason. Listen to me. If you go to sleep angry, you'll let the spirit of anger come in you. And there's a anger of reaction, and then there's the spirit of anger. You hurt you you came after me and I felt the need to retaliate that's the reaction of anger but I let that harbor in my mind and I go to sleep on it and it moves from external to it becomes internalized and then it turns from a wound to bitterness and bitterness is the door where all failure is attracted to. There's no joy in bitterness. There's no peace in bitterness. There's no happiness in bitterness. And bitterness is simply unforgiving results. All bitterness is, is you wanting someone to pay that hurt you. And Jesus guards his heart and won't die with unforgiveness. So he says, forgive them, God. Why? It's not for them. It's for me. I will not die with vengeance in my heart. Why? I'm their mediator. I will not let what hell did externally Rob me from an internal presence. Even on the cross with dehydration and tongue swelling. He had to make sure he got it out to his flesh. Forgive them. Let them off the hook. Because I do it for me. I want you to say, well, whoever hurt me will not imprison me no more. You're forgiven. And it ain't for you. It's for me. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. The love of Jesus set me free. Number four, change your focus. Just change your focus. Stop thinking about it. I was studying this and I had so many people I had to forgive. I think I'm still filling the list. Because God said, if you have any ill will, let, let me tell you a sign of unforgiveness, jealousy. Didn't know that. I said, now why did you tell me that? I'm sorry I told you all that. Because now you, 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 you're stuck with it. You know, one of the signs of, of unforgiveness is if you're a easily angered. You know why? You're still focused on it. You gotta change your focus. Start, you know what? Yeah, how many times? After all I do, this is how people treat me. After how I tried to give and give and give, and this is how they repaid me. Change your focus. Look at Jesus on the cross and say, After all I did, this is what they did to me. What makes you any, many, many better than your Lord? People hurt people. I, I can tell you this about people. If you're around people long enough, they hurt you. I, I say this and I got to go. 
If you're around people long enough, they're going to hurt you. Now, let me say it again. I don't think you're getting it. If you're around people long enough, they're going to hurt you. But if you hang around God long enough, he'll heal you. I have never walked with God and stayed angry. I have never went to his presence and left still hating somebody. When the woman at the well, Jesus sitting on the well. Do you got to go right now or can I go a few more minutes? Do you got to go? Do you have to go? Is it, do you have to go? If you do, I understand. I, I go, I'm hungry. I got a coffee roll on my desk with that maple frosting on it. I need to eat it. Jesus sitting on the well. And, and, and he's just he's sitting there all by himself because the disciples said, we don't go down there. We don't hang with them kind of people. Because it's a racial issue. The Samaritans were mixed blood, interracial. White and a black and hooked up. Gentile or Hebrew. And he's sitting there and I was reading it and I found in antiquities that it's the exact place where Jeroboam was crowned king. It's the very well that Abram dug. Jacob dug it. Redug it. Jesus is sitting there and probably reminiscing, man, I've been here many times in the histories. And this time he's sitting on a well that supplied life and it was life sustaining for people. But he ain't sitting there for any other reason, but he's waiting for a woman who was living in Samaria from the city of Sakar. And this word, Sakar, and the Bible is very specific to tell you what city she's from. And, and it's because Sakar in the Greek means she's intoxicated with her bitterness. She's from the city of intoxication. She's become in, drunk over her hatred. And she, he's sitting there and he sees her coming from a distance and and she's wrestling with her own identity. Because most people don't just need to forgive others. Most people need to forgive themselves. And I see her walking every day. You know what she's doing? Because she's a woman in a time where you cater to men. She's going to get water, not for herself, but for the men. And the Bible said she's with a sixth man and married five, divorced five, and now she's living with a baby daddy. She tried to do it right five times. Now she said, it's no use connecting. They all hurt me anyways. And she's on the way full of intoxicated with bitterness and unforgiveness, and she can't get into her future. Because she's full of hurt and unforgiveness. And he walks up, she walks up, and he says, Woman, I'm thirsty. Fetch me some water. And she said, Do you not know what I am? Do you not know who you are? What is a Jew asking a Samaritan for any favor? He said, He's unforgiven. How do you know when you're still full of bitterness you always react wrongly to requests you're guarded he said I know who you are but give me water anyways and she he says well you have nothing to draw with well you do draw from what you have she says you can't drink after us And then he looked at and he said, lady, he said, you've been married five times. I know all about you. You don't think I know you? You've been married five times, and the sixth man that's living in your house, and you hiding from the law, you just living with him. He brought up, I know your sins. They all talk about it. She didn't bring up. 
an excuse. You know what she brought back up to him? Worship. She said, then where can I worship? She knew the answer to her mistake was to get to the house. But they won't let me to the house because I'm not their color. And he said, I know I'm sleeping around. I know I got some marital problems. I'm intoxicated with failure. But where can I go to dump it? Where can I put a praise on it? And he never brought it up again. He said, lady, let me tell you something. There's coming a day. And now is this day. Where you ain't going to have to worship on that mountain or go over to that church to worship. But you're going to call and come worship in spirit and in truth. He said, because lady, sitting on this well is the only one you got to worship. This is the only place right now. This is your sanctuary. Draw me some water. Because he said, I'm telling you, there's coming some water, and it ain't in this well. But it's coming out my belly right now. That's why God said, out of your belly will flow rivers. Up. Somebody ought to throw your hands up and say, I got to forgive. I got to let you off the hook, man. He said, you brought up the right issue. Because she said, I can't fix myself. How did I get to God? I wrestle every day. Don't you know who I am? I'm half Jew. I'm half wrong to you. I wrestle every day. Am I, is the half of me good enough? Or is it this half that's judging me? It's my lifestyle versus my wishes. I really want to serve you. But this keeps pulling me back. I go to your house, but the voice of wrong relationships won't go silent. I want to sow, but poverty keeps crying. I want to change, but anger keeps coming. Unforgiveness. Sometimes it ain't people you got to forgive. It's just life. You just got to let life go. You just got to say, you know what? It is what it is. But my God is who he's going to be. We got to go. We got to go. We got. To. I dare you to just say, you know what? It is what it was. It is what it is. But my God is always going to be the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, I let this thing off the hook right now. Mama off the hook. Daddy's off. I, life, I forgive you. Failure, you're done. you not got a hold of me no more. I found the place to worship you in spirit and in truth. I drink from a water that never goes dry. Oh, how care what people say about it. People be talking about you when you leave, but you ain't you going to smile now. Don't you know who you are? I know whose I am. I know that God of heaven and earth still love me. I know that if everybody left me to the curb, he'd sit right on the curb with me. Put his arm around me and say, they don't love you like you, but I love you. And I'm going to help you get out this ditch. And I'm going to bring you to your future. Because look up here. Look up here. You don't need anybody but God like you. If God be for you, let me say it over here. This side might want it better. If God be for you, it don't matter who ain't pulling for you. My God is for me. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Lift both your hands up right now. Just lift both your hands up right now. Say, Father, I forgive everyone who hurt me. I heard the man of God. If you can forgive those that crucified you, hurt you, beat you, spat on you, mocked you, sneered you, embarrassed you, I can forgive anybody who's hurt me. Now let the wound in my heart become the womb to birth my future. 
I feel the Holy Ghost. I said, I feel the Holy Ghost. No, I said, I feel. I, I, I didn't say the Holy Spirit. I said, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel God flooding over somebody right now and ripping out bitterness and anger and past. And hey, somebody's about to walk out that door, a brand new man and a brand new woman. Because you put some love on it. Amen. Stand to your feet. Hug somebody. Bless somebody. And say, I put some love on it. Hug somebody really good too. And, and I want to see you. Come up and visit with me. Don't just run out. Hug somebody. Bless somebody. Tell them I love, I love you and I let it off the hook. If you're a visitor or guest with us today or your second time, if it's your second time, we still want to talk to you. Go out to my right. There's a door right there to my left. And go down there to your, your left, my right, and there's a room set up. We got some snacks and some second-time gifts for you, first-time gifts. If you're watching on the Internet and you might be watching replay, this is an anointed message for forgiveness. Seven last statements of a dying man who changed the world. If he can find the breath to forgive, you can too. There's healing, not for your enemy in forgiveness, but for you. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And if you'll pray that prayer, Holy Spirit, I let it go. Remember, Monday through Friday at 930, every, at Monday through Thursday, guaranteed, I'm doing morning motivation on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you're watching, this is April's partnership book. As you sow into this ministry, this is the book. Make sure we have your address when you sow your seed. If you're a monthly partner, this will be the book, Warfares You Must Win. One of them is in here over forgiveness, one of the battles you got to overcome. We love you. Thanks for watching. Follow us on all the social media. We do a lot of things here. We're reaching the city. We're reaching the world. We're reaching you. So I got one thing to say to you. Something good is about to happen for you. Take us away, guys. <laughs>